Yeah, I think we are live now. Thank you. So, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone that are watching from all around. And uh, today we have uh, Professor Greg McQuaffer. He is the director of Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations and a professor in School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. He has previously worked at the University of Illinois, the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And he received his PhD at the University of Toronto. He is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union. And he is the president of in International Commission on Clouds and Precipitation, ICCP. And the, he, his research concentrates on acquisition and analysis of cloud microphysics data from airborne field campaigns. <coughs> the, I'm very much glad to introduce uh, Greg here and uh, he has been very instrumental and supportive for the ICCP in India. And uh, also, uh, he has visited uh, uh, our institute and has given several interesting talks. And uh, this is, again, a golden opportunity for us to learn from him. And today, he is going to talk about the use of in-situ cloud microphysical observations for quantifying ice cloud microphysical properties and processes and their uncertainties. Let us welcome uh, wholeheartedly. Let us welcome Professor Greg McQuaffer. Thank you. Okay, well, Farah, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to talk uh, to everyone today. I'd also like to say that I welcome the opportunity when I'll be able to go and visit IITM again when the pandemic finally subsides. So I look forward to those opportunities in the future. And as Sara mentioned, today I would like to talk about how we use in situ cloud microphysical observations that are collected by aircraft and how that can help us to learn more about the processes occurring in clouds, what the cloud properties are, and also more importantly, what are some of those uncertainties. And to start with here, I'm showing a picture of a uh, convective anvil complex uh, just north of Darwin, Australia, which is one of the clouds that we've sampled with our airborne campaign. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the wide number of people that have helped contribute to what I'm going to be showing today. So I'll start off by showing the different members of my cloud physics research group at the University of Oklahoma, all of whom made substantial contributions to what I'm going to show today. I'd also like to acknowledge the United States Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, NASA and NOAA, all of who have contributed financially to the projects from which I'm going to show results from and also have provided financial support for me and my graduate students. There's a number of other people I would like to acknowledge. The names highlighted in red are all former students of my group and I'm going to be showing results from them today. And the names in white represent other people that I have collaborated with on uh, both the development and um, acquisition of data during the research projects that I'm going to describe today. As a way of an overview of what I would like to talk about, first of all, I would like to give a bit of motivation in why it is that we need to know about the cloud properties and why we use aircraft observations to learn about those cloud properties. And the main motivation for this is that there's substantial uncertainty both in understanding what cloud processes are and how we represent them in models. Then I would like to review the main techniques that we use to acquire observations using aircraft probes, which will concentrate on three classes of instruments, hot wire, scattering, and optical array probes. Uh, moving beyond that, I think it's very important to quantify and understand the sources of air in those measurements. So I'll talk about things like counting airs, air and variability, and how we actually perturb the system that we're trying to measure with our instruments. And then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, shattering corrections. 
The last two sections of the talk will talk about how we can use those observations to improve the representation of cloud processes and models. I'll be talking about one specific example where we talk about stochastic parameterizations for mass diameter relations of ice clouds. And then I'll talk a little bit about process studies, talking about some recent field campaigns that we conducted over the Southern Ocean. So to motivate this talk, I'm gonna show a picture of rush hour traffic in Chicago, Illinois on Groundhog's Day, which is February 2nd, 2011. And you can see in this particular day, unlike most days in Chicago, the traffic is not moving very well and not moving at all very well because there can be large amounts of precipitation that can be associated with winter storms. We use numerical models to try and produce quantitative precipitation forecast, but those models require an accurate representation of processes occurring in clouds, such as rhyming, aggregation, deposition, sublimation, and fallout that in turn require knowledge of the size, shape, and phase distribution of cloud particles. I could probably show a similar picture to show the results of severe rainfalls that are associated with monsoons or landfalling hurricanes and make the same point. So what we do is we take images, such as shown here. These are representative of some images of ice crystals and shown here, some rhymed ice par particles, some graupel particles, and some supercooled water drops that were obtained in this Groundhog's Day storm when our aircraft was flying through it. So what I need to talk about today is how do we use these images to give us information about the properties of clouds that can in turn tell us about the processes occurring in clouds, which in turn can help us better represent them in models. Or another way of looking at this, this shows a vertical profile with height on the vertical axis and some representative images of ice crystals that were sampled in the cloud over Darwin, Australia, that I showed in my very first slide. So then another question is, how can we use these vertical profiles of represented crystal images obtained in an anvil to help us better represent clouds in weather and climate models? Well, today, I'm mainly gonna talk about observations but I do want to show one modeling side. And here, this is a crude representation of a simple Goddard mixed phase ice uh, microphysical parameterization scheme, which is an example of one type of parameterization that is used in bulk numerical models uh, with bulk cloud microphysical schemes that represent the evolution of clouds. And most of these cloud schemes predict one or two moments of a size distribution for a number of different hydrometeor categories. So here we show the total mass of water vapor, which would be, say be in gram per meter cubed, ice crystals, snowflakes, graupel particles, liquid cloud drops that do not fall out of the cloud because they don't have appreciable fall velocity, and raindrops. And you see all of these arrows represent a transfer of mass between these different categories. As the mass is transferred between these categories, latent heat is either absorbed or released, which in turn feeds back on the dynamics of the cloud, which affects their evolution. And similarly, a lot of these particles can also have effects on the vertical profile of radiative heating, which also can affect the evolution of cloud properties. Now, it turns out that all of these hydrometeor transfer rates they depend on various microphysical properties, such as the size distribution, which is typically represented by a gamma function, which describes the number of particles with different, um, different particle sizes. Also for ice crystals, we need to know how the mass of a particle varies with its maximum dimension and how the fall velocity varies with its maximum dimension. And to calculate the radiative properties, we need to know the single scattering properties, such as the asymmetry parameter, the single scattering function, as well as the extinction and absorption coefficients. So in order to get these properties, we need to know information about the size, shape, and phase distribution of cloud particles. And other types of information we need to know, in addition to size distribution function and phase information, we need to know the crystal aspect ratios, which affect collection and fallout rates, we need to know the shapes and surface characteristics of ice crystals and their single scattering properties, which affect their impact on radiation. We also need to know the total water content, the total concentration of particles, 
the fall velocities and clustering of cloud particles. Well, we also need to know about how these properties vary depending upon the formation mechanism of clouds, the height at which the clouds occur, and their geographical location. Hence, we need observations in a variety of locations. Just like if you wanted to study a palm tree, you wouldn't go outside my house here in Oklahoma and look at the trees here. You would need to go to San Diego or Hawaii where palm trees occur. Thus, if we want to study, say, clouds that occur in landfalling hurricanes, we might need to be based out of Florida to do an aircraft project and so on and so on. So what this box really shows is my life story in cloud physics, where all of the blue squares show locations where myself or members of my group have gone to make measurements of cloud properties, and all the red boxes show where we plan to go in the future. And you can see you need to go to a wide variety of locations, up in the Arctic to measure, say, if you want to understand Arctic climate, uh, in the United States to, say, understand winter storms or mesoscale convective systems, off Africa if you want to understand how biomass burning affects the extensive stratocumulus deck to the west coast of Africa, if you want to understand uh, climate change, you need to know about pristine conditions over the Southern Ocean, and then you might understand oceanic convection, say over Darwin, Australia, or uh, um, French Guiana, and so on and so on. Well, it is very difficult to make measurements of cloud particles because cloud particles can cover orders of magnitude of difference of sizes. So we need to deal with small particles ranging from cloud condensation nuclei, which have sizes around 0.1 micrometers and concentrations of about 1,000 per cubic centimeter. We need to worry about larger particles like haze drops and cloud drops, which are increasingly larger. Drizzle drops that get up to about 100 micrometers in size, but of concentration three orders of magnitude less of about one per cubic centimeter. And raindrops that in turn have sizes of one millimeter, which is a order, three orders of magnitude greater in mass than drizzle drops, and concentrations of one per liter, which is actually six orders of magnitude less than cloud condensation nuclei. Given this wide range of sizes that we need to deal with, it's not surprising that a single cloud probe will not work to make measurements of all cloud sizes and out cloud properties that we are concerned with. So here I'm showing an example of an aircraft wing during a field project where we were studying Arctic clouds. And you can see just hanging off one of the wings, you can see a wide variety of different cloud probes that are used to make measurements of different properties of the cloud and different sized particles. So what are some of the different manners in which we can make these in situ measurements from aircraft? Well, one thing we want to measure is the size distributions. And we have two main different types of cloud probes that we make to use uh, measurements of the size distributions. One are what we call forward scattering probes. And how these work is essentially you have a laser beam that is exposed in this sampling volume with the laser in here and a lot of focusing and uh, measuring electronics in the other pod. And what you do as a ice particle or cloud particle passes through this beam as the aircraft moves forward, you convert the amount of light that is scattered in the forward direction to a particle size using me theory. And this works well for spherical liquid cloud drops between about 1 and 50 microns in size. It doesn't work well for larger particles or for ice particles because the me theory upon which the relationship between the scattered light and particle size is based is only valid for spherical particles. So to get ice particles and larger size particles, we use a group of probes that are called optical array probes. And here, again, we have a laser beam inside our probe housing here which uh, there's some focusing and um, transferring uh, optics and mirrors and such like that. So that again, the beam is exposed here where the cloud particles fall through. And on the other side here, we have some more mirrors and focusing and so on. But the important thing is we have an array of what is called photodiode detectors that measure whether the light is hitting on the photodiode or not. And when a particle passes through the laser beam, it occults or shadows the photodiode detector such that the absence of a signal is identified as the presence of a particle. 
So there is an array of about 64 of these photodiodes, or 128 and some probes. And more importantly, the photodiode array is attached to a very fast response electronics so that every time the plane moves the width of a photodiode array, which is about 25 microns or so, the array is clocked so that we record the array one more for each time the plane moves 25 microns, which works out to about a million times a second. Hence, that gives us a two-dimensional view of what the particle looks like, from which we can get information both on the shape and size of the cloud particle. To get better resolution images of hydrometeors, we also use some high-resolution image probes, which are very similar to the electronics on, your, say, your iPhone. And here we have a couple of detection lasers, which causes a higher-powered imaging laser to fire when at least one particle is in the depth of field of the probe. And hence, then, that gets an image of this particle on a two-dimensional array of detectors so that we have higher-resolution images of the hydrometeors up to about 2.3 micrometers in size. And then we also can have what we call bulk probes that measure not the size resolve quantities, but rather resolve... Uh, measure the bulk properties of the cloud, such as maybe the total amount of liquid water or the total amount of water. So they just measure the total grams per meter cubed of water that is present, maybe by drawing in the cloud particles, evaporating or melting them, and then measuring the amount resultant amount of water vapor with something like a Lyman alpha hygrometer. Similarly, you can get probes that measure the bulk extinction and those with a vibrating wire on which supercooled water uh, freezes, changes the frequency of vibration so we can measure the presence of supercooled water. So here is an example of one of these bulk probes that measures the bulk water content. The key with these measurements is redundancy. We have lots of different probes, and this allows us to assess the consistency of probes. So if we have multiple probes measuring size distribution, in the overlap range, we look to make sure that we have consistency between the size distribution because this helps ensure that the probes are performing well because the probes are actually flying through a rather hostile environment. You start at the ground, which may be 30 degrees Celsius, and maybe you fly up into an ice cloud, which is about negative 60 or negative 70 degrees Celsius in the tropics. This uh, freezing and heating, it's not very good to electronics, so sometimes these probes cease to work. You also might have some vibrations on the wing and things like that, which may knock the probes out of focus. So these consistency tests are very important to assess how well the probes are performing. And we also can do what are called closure tests. If we have a measure of bulk liquid water, we should be able to derive that bulk liquid water if we integrate the size distributions. So this is another way in which we can assess how well the probes are performing. Well, for the next part of my talk, I would like to talk about sources of uncertainty in these measurements. Just like any measurement that you've done from the time you started your undergraduate physics classes, you need to have an uncertainty in any measurement that you make. So here I'm going to talk about three main sources of uncertainty that we have in our microphysical measurements. One would be errors due to uh, statistical sampling, or what I call counting statistics, that I'll represent as EC. Another error is the variability in the microphysics for the same condition. If you go and measure a cloud that you think is in the exact same conditions, namely it's at the same temperature, the same humidity, maybe it was generated by synoptic uplift, even when you make measurements of clouds in the exact same condition, you won't have the exact same microphysics because we just can't know the conditions that well. So I'll say that there's a variability error. Even if we think we're making the microphysics measurements in the same conditions, there's some variability in the quantity. And then I'll talk also a little bit about measurement errors, which are errors we get by perturbing the physical system in which we're making measurements. So to start, I'll talk a little bit about the counting errors. So in this plot here, on the vertical axis, I have the number distribution function as a function of diameter on the horizontal axis. And the blue line is showing our representation of the size distribution and what we measured uh, in this particular experiment, which was off the coast of French Guiana. But I want to draw your attention to these air bars. Here, the air bars that I'm drawing are proportional to the square root of the number of particles that I counted in a number of different bins. 
So to get the number distribution function, we take the total number of particles, we divide by the sample volume of the probe and the width of the size bin that we're sorting the particles into. And we can say that there's an error in the counting statistics proportional to the square root of the number of particles, uh, which corresponds to Poisson statistics. So then the question is, how does this counting error compare to, say, how much variability we get in the cloud quantities? So this is a bit of a different plot. I still have the number distribution function on the vertical axis, but here I have time on the horizontal axis, and the different colors correspond to the measured number distribution function and how it varies as a function of time for bins centered at a number of different diameters as indicated uh, on the axis uh, for the particular colors. Again, here the air bars correspond to the counting statistics. And you can get an idea about the variability air by how much these number distribution functions vary over this three minute time period where observations were collected in a stratiform cloud generated behind an oceanic convective system. And what you see for this particular case is that the counting air and the variability air are quite comparable for this period. However, if you do the same thing for a more convective period in the same project, what you see in this particular instance here, you can see over this three minute period where there was higher ice water contents and more convective activities, there's a lot more variability. So that the air and the variability is much greater than the air associated with counting statistics. And in general, if you choose the appropriate probe to make the measurements and you integrate over an appropriate averaging period that gives you statistical significance at the same time as allowing to you to see some of the fine scale variability of the cloud, you can usually get it so that the air in this counting statistics is smaller than the air in the variability of the cloud parameters. Well, the final source of air I would like to talk a little bit about is that of measurement airs. And we can actually perturb the system in which we're making the measurements. So to show an example of this, here in this upper plot on the right is an example of a cloud probe with standard tips. And you can see as the aircraft is traveling along at about 150 meter per second through a field of ice particles, as some of these ice particles hit on the tips of the probe, they're going to shatter or break up into lots of tiny pieces. Some of these tiny pieces may be swept into the sample volume where the probe will then measure the presence of a lot of small ice crystals. That is what the probe is seeing, so it is a correct measurement but obviously it is not representative of the cloud we want to sample. So what we want to do is we want to try and avoid these measurement errors. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. One is Alexei Korolev of Environment and Climate Change Canada has designed some what he calls modified or K-tips. So they're machined in such a way that the shattering events still happen because that's going to happen when an ice crystal hits a tip. But these tips are angled so that most of the shattered particles are directed away from the measurement sample volume. Another way you can eliminate these shattered artifacts is through processing techniques. So if you look at the log of the inter-arrival time on the horizontal axis and the normalized frequency of occurrence of these uh, inter-arrival times, when you look at the observations, you typically see two peaks. One with the larger inter-arrival times on the right are distributed according to Poisson statistics, and those are what is expected, the distribution of inter-arrival times. But you also see a peak of very small inter-arrival times, which is what you would expect when a single large particle shatters into many small particles. And these smaller particles, or shattered particles, can be eliminated by eliminating these particles in the small peak. Of course, it's not quite that easy because frequently there can be an overlap region. So what you want to do is you want to try to eliminate all of these particles in the shattered peak while keeping all the particles in the real peak. And there's different details of how that is done. To show that this is actually a real phenomena, this is a video that Alexei Korolev supplied me with where he put one of the standard probe tips in a wind tunnel in Cleveland. And what you can see as the ice crystals come and they hit upon the probe tip, you can see some of these events where the particles are shattering on impact and you can see the streamlines are being followed into the shattered volume where they will be measured as real small particles. So this suggests that indeed the shattering of these ice crystals 
is a real problem. So to investigate this further, a number of years ago, myself and a graduate student put probes that were identical in all fashions except the different types of tips on an aircraft which we use to fly through snowstorms over Wyoming in the United States. So here, in this picture here, you can see here, circled in red, is a 2DC probe, a two-dimensional cloud probe, measuring particles between about 50 microns and greater than one millimeters with standard tips. And in the blue, you can see it has the modified tips so that they're machined so that the shattered particles will be deflected away from the sample volume. And when you look at the data from this type, these probes, here you can plot the number distribution function on the vertical axis as a function of diameter on the horizontal axis. The black solid line shows the 2D probe with its standard tips, no processing algorithms applied. And the dashed line shows what we get when we apply the algorithms um, to these standard measurements. And what you can see is that the algorithms are removing a lot of particles smaller than about 500 micrometers in size, as you would expect, because most of the shattered particles are indeed the smaller particles. And then if you look and compare against the observations from the probe with the modified tips, you see that the modified tips remove about as many small particles as the algorithms. So this suggests that both the algorithms and the tips are probably doing a good job in removing uh, some of the shattered particles. And also, you can see if you look at the larger particles, you see that both the algorithms and the tips produce minimal change for particles larger than about 500 micrometers in size, as you would expect, because these larger particles would probably be real particles and would not be generated by these shattering algorithms. So in general, what we do now is we use probes with both the modified tips and apply algorithms to the data to try and eliminate most of this problematic data. Well, based on this, some people have said, well, that means we have to throw out all cloud data maybe collected before about 2015 when these algorithms and tips became very common in use. Well, that may or may not be the case depending upon what you want to get out of the cloud data. So to illustrate this, we went and examined how this impacts the bulk mass content. So here we show the ice water content derived from the modified tips uh, on the vertical axis as a function of the ice water content we derive from the observations collected with the standard tips. And each of these blue dots corresponds to a 10 second average size distribution from which the ice water content was derived uh, during one of the projects. And what you see, the black solid line at the top represents the one to one curve and the blue represents the best fit to the data. And what you see is that on average, the ice water content that you're getting from the modified tips is about 20% less than that that you're getting um, from the standard tips. So this shows that the standard tips are giving probably about a 20% error in the mass content. I'll make the argument that that shows you can still use the old data to calculate something like the ice water content, which is dominated by the higher order moments, because there's a greater than 20% uncertainty in trying to compute a mass from a two-dimensional image of a particle because you have to make assumptions about its three-dimensional shape and also its density. On the other hand, measurements of total number concentration are very problematic because they're dominated by the smaller crystals, which are most impacted by the shattering events. One other problem you have to worry about is the location of the probes on the aircraft. It is conventional knowledge in clouds that the best location for our observations is to have the probes as far beneath and as far ahead of the leading edge of the aircraft wing. So during a recent project called Oracles, where we made observations in stratocumulus off the west coast of Africa, we were able to test the impact of the mounting location of the probes because we had two different pylons. The new pylon here correctly positioned the uh, probes well ahead of the leading wing of the aircraft, whereas the older pylon here, you can see in this particular case, the probes are actually behind the leading wing of the aircraft. So we were worried that some of the flow characteristics over the wing could be affecting uh, the measurements. 
So what we did is we had two different cloud droplet probes for measuring liquid cloud droplets between 1 and 50 microns, and we were able to compare the measurements that we got from ahead of the leading wing and behind the leading wing with these two CDPs. And we switched their location halfway through the project to make sure that different probe functioning would not influence our result. So uh, here we see the switch after we've uh, switched the location of the two aircraft probes. And when we do this, you can compare measurements from the probe that was made on the old pylon, the Hawaii cloud droplet probe, as a function of the Lark cloud droplet probe and the new pylon. So you can compare things like the cloud droplet concentration shown in A, the liquid water content shown in B, and the effective radius shown in Z, C, with the different colors corresponding to the pitch angle of the aircraft. And what you can see is that the points are quite well clustered along the one-to-one -one line. And this was a bit surprising to us because we thought that the uh, location on the aircraft might have had a bit more of a bias on the observations. And then when we switched the location of the two probes so that the Hawaii CDP was on the new pylon and the Lark CDP on the old pylon, we got very similar results. So there wasn't an inherent difference in the functioning of the probes and the types of results we got. So actually from this, we concluded that maybe, you know, some of the locations, uh, maybe it's not quite as important to be as ahead and as far beneath the leading wing as possible. But nevertheless, I would still recommend that as the best location uh, because the, this result could be a function of what particular aircraft you're using to make measurements. So in the next part of my probe, I'd now like to talk, a, a talk I would next like to talk a little bit about how we can take some of our observations and use this to improve representation and models. And I'm only going to have time to talk about one example, and here I'm going to talk about how we represent mass dimensional relations. So basically, if you take a look, and these are some classic pictures of ice particles made by Locatelli and Hobbes in a paper by 1974, we are challenged by the fact that we need to come up with a single mass dimensional relation for models. And this is challenged by the fact that there's a wide range of shapes, sizes, and phase of cloud particles that are observed in situ. And typically in models, you use a relation of the form M equals AD to the B, where these A and B parameters representing uh, this relationship are typically held constant or are a simple function of environmental conditions. So when I had a graduate student starting a few years ago, I said, well, you know, you can write a paper, you can come up and find a new A and B, say that works really well and for your particular conditions measured and do that. But maybe more importantly, it's try important to try to figure out what affects the variability of A and B relations. So what I asked them to do was to take all studies that had been published in the literature and plot the B values that had been used in this relationship as a function of A. And this is the result. These previous studies show that there's a very large spread in A and B. So for example, comparing A and B from uh, orographic cirrus and black, we get very different results from the type A and B that are derived from cirrus generated by large scale ascent in the light blue. But more importantly, you see that e even when you look at all these observations and der derivation of AB coefficients that have been made from observations collected in large scale ascent, there's a lot of variability even in the same environment. So this suggests that maybe when we apply these A and B coefficients in models, maybe then rather than using fixed values, maybe we should be using more of a stochastic uh, parameterization that gives a range of values, and maybe we draw randomly from that range of values that might be more appropriate for use in a model. But that gives questions like, well, still, how does the range of parameters that we use, how does that depend on environmental conditions? How does the uncertainties that I've talked about in this in situ data affect the variability of uncertainty of such parameters? And how do these uncertainties scale up to model predicted fields? So to investigate this, the approach we used is we used some data that were collected in mesoscale convective systems in the United States. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to choose A and B coefficients that minimize the chi-square difference between bulk measurements of mass or coincident radar reflectivity and estimates of mass or radar reflectivity that are derived from the in-situ distributions. 
This had been used a lot of times before, but the difference in our approach is we said that we are going to say we have a surface of solutions in A and B phase space that are within some delta chi squared of the uh, A and B that are the minimizing this chi squared, and we're going to say those are equally realizable solutions. I don't have time today to talk about how we derive delta chi squared, uh, but we do have that in a couple of papers that were previously published. So to investigate this, we use data that were collected in the mid-latitude continental convective cloud experiment, which was conducted in 2011. And here what we did is we looked at convective clouds in the vicinity of the ARM Southern Great Plains site, which were sampled with the University of North Dakota citation. So the black lines here shows where we were flying the uh, citation aircraft. And they are superimposed in tops of measurements of reflectivity, which were obtained by the Vance Air Force Base Oklahoma radar. And then what we did is we matched those location, uh, observations of reflectivity to the locations of the in situ measurements. And we derived surfaces of A and B solutions that were within some delta chi squared of the minimum value. And our results show here with B on the vertical axis again and A in the horizontal axis, you can see the type of surfaces we get and the different colors correspond to the surfaces that we get and how they vary as a function of temperature. A couple of big conclusions here is that the A and B solutions are highly covariable and there's a greater range in A and B when there's less variability in the cloud properties. So to look at how this type of analysis affects models, we then went and run some ensemble simulations of this particular case, which are published in a paper by McKenna Stanford in uh, 2019. And what we did is we compared simulations for these MC3E convective events that were conducted with stochastic microphysics with a deterministic scheme compared to an ensemble scheme. And what we did when we ran the ensemble scheme is we drew A and B parameters stochastically according to some prescribed spatiotemporal autocorrelation scale. So to show the results of these ensemble simulations, here on the vertical axis, what I'm doing is I'm showing the mean volumetric precipitation as a function of time. The black and dashed lines are showing some observations of what the precipitation should be. And what I'm showing is members of the ensemble simulations are in the different colored lines. And what you see is that the ensemble mean volumetric precipitation varies only slightly between the ensemble configurations. So at first glance, this might suggest that this uh, stochastic type of approach isn't that important. But if we look at that a little more carefully, and we look at the spread in precipitation, what you see is the stochastic schemes with the red, blue, and light blue, depending upon the uh, autocorrelation scale, they produce slightly different spreads than that which we would get if we ran a simulation where we randomly varied the potential temperature perturbation that we used to initialize the simulation. But the spreads were, of course, less than a fixed parameter ensemble where we used different A and B simulations. And also, they were less than the spread that we would get if we varied the initial and boundary conditions. But it's important to note that we're looking at precipitation here. If instead we look at the impact of running these A and B simulations, say, in the properties of the anvil cirrus, where here we're plotting ice water path on the horizontal axis, optical depth in the vertical axis, what you can see with the different colors for the ensemble perturbations with the red and blue, you can see that the variability of tau for a given ice water path in the stochastic and simulations is much greater than the variability we get in the simulations that we run by varying the initial and boundary conditions. So this shows that the stochastic scheme does capture a degree of variability that is not captured even by ensemble simulations where we vary the initial and cloud boundary conditions. And this will have an impact on cloud radiative forcing. And we suspect, as we're doing right now, is if we start to add this stochastic ensembles into, say, velocity diameter relations, you'll probably have a greater impact also on the volumetric precipitation that is produced by these simulations. Well, what I would like to do is to take my last few minutes to talk a little bit about how in situ observations can be used to improve our understanding of processes. 
And I'm going to show some examples of a recent field campaign we conducted over the Southern Ocean to do this. Well, this particular field campaign was motivated by a problem with the CMIP-5 models, in that if you look at the circled area here over the Southern Ocean, we find that these CMIP-5 models, compared to satellite observations of radiative fluxes, they do not reflect enough sunlight over the Southern Ocean. And this ensemble mean air indicates that too much shortwave radiation is being absorbed by the Earth's surface. And this may influence the circulation and may correlate with climate sensitivity. And we believe the problem with these models is that the clouds, particularly low-level, mid-level clouds that occur in the dry sectors of the cyclones that migrate across the Southern Ocean, are poorly represented in climate and numerical weather prediction models, probably because the amount of supercooled water is underestimated because it's a much more pristine conditions than, say, over the Arctic or mid-latitudes, where a lot of the form foundations of the parameterizations that go into this model are based. So because of that, we conducted a project over the Southern Ocean called Socrates, where we use the National Science Foundation G5 aircraft to sample clouds, aerosols, and precipitation from Hobart, Australia, to within about 400 miles of the Antarctic. We conducted 15 flights with this aircraft, representing 118 hours of data, four flights over an Australian research vessel, two over Macquarie Island, where we had a ground-based site, and also released 109 dropsons to characterize how the structure of the boundary layer varied in a north-south curtain between Hobart and the Antarctic. So to give an idea of the type of observations we collected in this project, the yellow lines show all of the flight tracks that we flew. They were in slightly different locations so that we could target the uh, dry sector, cold dry sector of these clouds. And then the blue colors show where we had a ship sailing from the uh, Australians. Uh, the red line shows the location of a ground site at Macquarie Island. And the green line shows additional ship cruises that we had where we put an array of instrument on an Australian icebreaker as it made routine cruises between Hobart and the Australian Antarctic stations at Mawson, Davis, and Casey. And the type of results you get are quite interesting. So here I'm going to show observations from a high spectral resolution LIDAR, which we had on the aircraft. If you look at the bottom panel first, I have altitude plotted on the vertical axis as a function of time. And what you see with these areas where we have greater amounts of backscatter coefficient, this is identifying the presence of clouds. This LIDAR also measures depolarization ratio. And you can see that where these clouds are occurring, there's a lot of blue color, which corresponds to very low depolarization ratio, which suggests the particles are spherical, showing that we're having a lot of supercooled water in these clouds. So we did additional analysis to look and understand how the probability of occurrence of different phases, that is liquid only, mixed phase where ice and liquid coexist, and ice only varied as a function of temperature. And here we have probability plotted on the vertical axis as a function of temperature in the horizontal axis. And if you look at the lead red line, you see there's a very large frequency of supercooled liquid water at temperatures as cold as negative 20 degrees Celsius, which is much colder than is typically seen, say, in Arctic field campaigns. So we are definitely seeing a lot of supercooled water here, which probably suggests why the models are performing poorly. Also, it's interesting to note that we can get a lot of ice phase only clouds, even at temperatures as warm as negative five to zero degrees Celsius. And this is the subject of a number of papers that have been written by graduate student Troy Zaremba, which have recently ap appeared in the Journal of Geophysical Research. So to look a little bit more about why we're getting this supercooled water, I want to show one last set of analysis from the Socrates experiment. So on the right here, I'm showing a photo that was taken from the wing of the aircraft. And you see that this stratus deck or stratocumulus deck over these cold, dry sector of the cyclone is not horizontally uniform, but rather we have some protruding features that come out of these, which are called generating cells, where we have updraft motion. These generating cells have previously been noted in wintertime storms in the mid-latitudes, also over the Arctic. And what these generating cells do is they characterize a small region of locally enhanced high reflectivity at cloud top <clears throat> from which an enhanced reflectivity trail 
characteristic of falling snow can originate. So here we're showing uh, some of our radar data from uh, the Socrates experiment, and you can see these cloud generating cells with the radar streaks emanating from beneath. And these generating cells were nearly ubiquitous in southern ocean clouds. So to look and understand how the microphysical properties of these generating cells vary compared to other clouds, my graduate student, Yong Wong, he took a look and did some analysis on that. So to show his approach, in the upper panel here, I'm showing some radar reflectivity measurements, and the green shaded parts are the appearance of generating cells, which were identified by a measure of reflectivity called prominence, where prominence was greater than 4 dBz. And when he did that, we noted that the mean generating cell width was only about 400 meters, which is substantially narrower than what has been seen for generating cells, say, in mid-latitudes in the United States or over the Arctic. He also compared how the properties of these clouds varied compared to whether we were inside or outside the generating cells. So in the upper plot here, I'm showing the number concentration of liquid water drops, and you're seeing with the pink color, with the box and whisker plots, also showing the outliers, that the number concentrations are quite a bit bigger inside compared to outside the generating cells. You also see the liquid water contents in the middle plot are also larger inside rather than outside the generating cells, and also the ice water contents are larger inside the generating cells compared to outside the generating cells. Note that mixing does, with the small um, widths, does seem to minimize the difference between the generating cells and outside the generating cells. But nevertheless, the generating cells do provide a favorable environment for growth of cloud particles by both deposition and rhyming, like has previously been observed in mid-latitude and Arctic cases. Okay, so that there's plenty of time to discussion, I'd like to summarize now. And I'd like to note that we've developed a greater understanding of measurement uncertainties associated with in situ cloud probes in the last 10 years. So it makes it easier both to understand our observations better and probably also to compare observations collected in different field projects by different groups. I'll also note that it's important to develop stochastic parameterization of ice microphysics that take into account sources of uncertainty, like measurement errors, statistical errors, and variability. We've developed them for size distributions and mass relationships. We're developing them right now for fall velocity relationships. And also in situ properties are being used both here and in India and in other locations around the world to learn more about processes occurring in the clouds. So what does the future hold? We need to make observations in far more regimes to learn more about processes affecting cloud properties. We also need to analyze data in a consistent manner between groups because of varying aerosol, air characteristics. We need to develop more parameterizations. And importantly, we need to separate the dependence on environmental conditions from variability and uncertainty. And also, as uh, president of ICCP, I think ICCP has a big role in doing this by trying to bring the international community together, both for trying to get us to analyze our data in consistent manners and also to identify locations where we may be able to have international collaborative projects that we conduct. Uh, and finally, we need to also better apply these stochastic parameterization in models to determine their impact. So with that, I'd like to stop and I'd like to be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Very, very nice, a very interesting, in-depth talk. And uh, we shall first take the questions from the audience. Uh, Mahin? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, there is a comment, actually, uh, from Autopilot. Um, um, another uncertainty is the lack of comprehensive array of instruments, uh, like lack of aerosol instrumentation, uh, presence of large concentration of large aerosols can introduce biases into scattering probes. Your comment. Uh, well, we certainly, one thing I did not talk a lot about today that we need to lot, know a lot about is um, aerosol cloud interactions. So it's very important to know about what are the properties of aerosols, how many particles there are, 
also about their composition. Uh, this is a great uncertainty in climate models in order to represent those. In terms of uh, the interference of aerosols on the cloud observations themselves, uh, that's not as big of a problem because uh, the concentration of, say, ultra-giant nuclei, which would be in the range of the cloud observations, the cloud particles from greater than three microns, there are not a lot of those. In fact, the bigger problem is the interference of cloud particles when you're trying to make uh, measurements of aerosols and clouds. Um, so there are a lot of aerosol, there are some aerosol instrumentation that both measures the size distributions and their composition. They work, you know, better when you're outside of cloud than inside of cloud. Uh, sometimes inside of clouds, you can draw the cloud particles into something like a counterflow virtual impactor. If you evaporate the cloud particles, you're left with the residuals. You can measure the residual aerosol amounts. But it's very important to get coincident observations of both aerosols and cloud particles. Yeah, uh, from autopilot again, uh, there is a comment. Uh, there are many parameterization approaches also size distribution, good to have all of them in analysis for comparison. I totally agree with this uh, comment from Autopilot. You know, there are a lot of parameterization approaches. There are a lot of parameterizations of size distributions. And just, you know, the one example I showed for the mass diameter coefficients with those A and B coefficients, just so the incredible wide number of parameters and values of those parameters that exist in the literature. And those are just one, one set of parameters that go into these models. We really need to better understand the variability and why different people have got different observations or why they've got the same observations. You know, is it the fact that we have errors in our measurements or is it because we're actually making measurements in different environments? So, you know, we need to we need to do a lot more comparison, especially between observations of different groups. And it's complicated by the fact that different groups sometimes use different probes. Some of them may be better calibrated than other cali uh, than others. And also, it's complicated by the fact that different people may use different processing packages to analyze the results. But we really do need to do these comparisons in order to better understand the differences. And I think the international community and workshops will really do a good job in trying to uh, help better understand that. And I think especially when the pandemic ends and we can have face-to-face -face interactions, that will work better. Yeah. Um, uh, there are two questions from Sachin Patade. Uh, how much uncertainty is expected in observation? This number concentration after using correlative scattering algorithm. Uh, do we still need to ignore ice particles with diameter smaller than 200 micrometer? Okay, well, that's a very good question, Sashin. And um, there's one other issue which I did not have time to talk about. And that is the fact that a lot of these optical array probes, they have very, the, you have to know the depth of field to know when the particles are in focus. And for small particles, that depth of field is very small. And even more problematic is that it's very size dependent. So it varies a lot with size over the small particle range. So what that means is if you measure one count, that can give you a very large concentration. And if you size that one count slightly wrongly, you can have very different concentrations because of the large dependence of the sample, uh, sample area and the depth of field. And then complicating that even further is if you have particles outside the depth of field, that does not necessarily mean you haven't imaged them. It may mean that you have an image that you know, might be something like a donut or if it's way outside of the depth of field, you might have a large particle which appears as a little small particle. So there is still an awful lot of uncertainty in these small particles. So still in most of my analysis, I do ignore particles smaller than about 125 micrometers from the optical array probes. Maybe you can go down to 50 micrometers. You have to look at it very carefully. 
So that is still an area where a lot of research is needed, really this gray zone between about 50 and 125 micrometers, where there's still a lot of uncertainty for reasons that really go beyond the uh, shadow. But that is a very good question. Uh, from him again, uh, another question. If I want to validate the model simulated ice number concentration with observations, what will be the best lower size threshold for observed ice particle number concentrations? Okay, another great question. And what I typically do, I would use a threshold somewhere of about 125 to 150 microns because I would have more confidence in the observations when you're in ice. When you're in liquid clouds, of course, the liquid cloud droplets, you can get very well from the forward scattering probes. But for the um, ice crystals, I would still use about 125 micrometers because there, there is a lot of uncertainty for the smaller particles. Um, you know, there are probes coming online that will help fill that in. The holodeck is a great probe that can go a little bit s smaller. Uh, in ice phase condition, the FIPS HALO, which is a probe from Emma Arvinen and Martin Schneider, it can probably go to about 40 microns. Uh, both of those probes, the, the FIPS HALO doesn't have as large of a sample volume, so it's harder to get the fine scale structure of the cloud. The holodeck tends to have very computationally intensive analysis. So both of those probes are great for doing supplementary analysis over smaller time periods but they can't quite give you the whole picture for the whole field campaign as easily with some of the conventional optical array probes. So your bulk analysis with the 2DS, something like that, I'd probably still 100, 125 micrometers, but I would try to supplement with some of the other probes that are coming online to go to a bit smaller sizes for some select time periods. Hello? Uh, there are more questions, Mahesh. Yeah. Uh, uh, we can't hear him. I can't hear him. You can hear him. Uh, maybe no, I can. No. Uh, can you hear me uh, or who? who can yeah, yeah, hear? yeah. We can hear yeah, him. No, I can hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is question from Emmanuel Fontaine uh, about mass size uh, relationship uh, and the coefficients. Sure, there is large variability uh, at A and B with high correlation. Mm -hmm. Are you ever of the studies that use the impact of temperature on the A and B coefficient? Certainly. Uh, certainly there is, um, there is variability. This is an important point, is that there is a lot of variability in A and B coefficients, but also A and B coefficients do have dependence on some environmental parameters. Probably the most important study, and Emmanuel himself has, has done a lot of investigation of the A and B coefficients, probably one of the most important environmental parameters that affects the A and B coefficient is the temperature. Uh, other things can, that affect it you can determine whether it's in convective or synoptic clouds, can depend what uh, location you're making the measurements at, and it can even be the proximity and age of convection can also affect the A and B coefficients. And then, in some ways, actually, the techniques that you use to derive the A and B coefficients, whether you're using a bulk mass probe or a measurement of bulk reflectivity, that can also have some impact on the A and B coefficients. So there's a lot of sources of variability there, some of which are environmental, some of which are instrumental, and then there's also a variability component. So what you have to try to do is to tease out the signal from all of those competing factors. And uh, yeah, so there's definitely signals there, but there's also a lot of variability even within the same temperature range. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is another question from Louis Jeffux. Where do you think ice crystal habits classification could contribute to error determination? Okay, well, this is a, another good question. Um, it's very important to have some knowledge of the ice crystal habits for a few reasons. One is, one thing to remember, when we make measurements of the ice crystals with any probe, we're basically getting a two-dimensional image of the ice crystal. You know, there's some, some ground probes that Tim Garrett and others have developed where you can get some information on three-dimensional shape at the ground by having cameras at multiple angles. That's much harder to do in an aircraft. So we're getting a two-dimensional image of a particle. So a hexagonal column can look very different 
uh, depending upon how you, what orientation you look at this particular crystal. So that's one problem. Also, knowledge of the habits is very important. You know, you may get different amounts of shattering. One of the things we did when we were comparing the probes with the standard tips and the modified tips, we tried to look at it as a function of habit because some habits may be more prone to shattering than other habits. And then certainly when you're dealing with things like mass dimensional relationships, really the habit is what is determining what A and B are. You know, other things like temperature, the reason why you're having a temperature dependence primarily is maybe because your habits are depending on temperature. So definitely um, ice crystal habits are very important to know. And that's why, you know, you need to have those high resolution imagers I talked about to try and get the best possible information you can get about ice crystal habits. Yeah, uh, there is a question again from Autopilot. Uh, considering Moray's law and the growing field of atmospheric research how come in your opinion there is not as much advance in probe development and many groups still use 30 to 40 years old probes well that's another good question and one thing i would say is although the basic design of the probes that are being used that are 30 to 40 years old the probes themselves are not that old there's been a lot of enhancements and updates to those probes in terms of, say, processing electronics, they're much faster. The quality of some of the components that go in, uh, the tips, you know, taking into account eliminating these shattered artifacts, um, you know, the um, number of photodiodes, the speed of processing. So there certainly has been improvements to the conventional technology, but it is a very good, it is a very insightful comment that you know a lot of the technology we are using is 30 to 40 years old in the sort of the the measurement techniques itself it shows that you know some of the first measurement techniques that came up with were pretty good but the other interesting thing is um having been in the field for about 30 years now many times i keep seeing new probes being developed and they all do an advance to it. But every time the probe is developed, like this is going to be the greatest thing. This is going to solve all of our measurement problems. And it inevitably contributes to our field of knowledge, but it's not the, what is it, the panacea that, you know, improves all of our problems. And to be honest, you know, we're still learning how to understand and interpret. Uh, it's taken us 30 to 40 years in some ways to really understand how to interpret and how to understand the observations that are collected from those different probes. And the new probes are going to take the same time. Um, there is an awful lot of development of new probes going uh, on right now. And we are making gradual progress, but nothing really. And all, a lot of these new probes are used, like the Phipps Halo, the Holodeck. You know, that new measurement technology is out there. And it's used in more limited circumstances. There's nothing that really replaces this ability of the 2DS and the FSSP, the hot wire probes, to collect these long time series that can be more easily analyzed. Uh, Greg, maybe here, maybe I should ask one uh, one thing. Uh, like, uh, the in, uh, that is when when uh, that you have showed that uh, uh, using radar and uh, in situ observations together. Uh, maybe maybe that is something that uh, can give a bit more of insights, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the first the first field campaign I ever worked on was in 1993. It was the Central Equatorial Pacific experiment, where we were flying along the Equatorial Pacific out of Fiji, and we just had cloud data. We had no remote sensing data, and you know, it it is. The, the remote sensing data is critical for two reasons. One is it gives you critical information about the context in which your cloud observations are made. You need to know more than just temperature. It varies at what height you are in the cloud, you know, where you are in the cloud, and also how close you are to convection, how close you are to frontal systems. Without that context, it is going to be impossible to well interpret your cloud data. 
And then also, you know, the bulk measurements from the radar reflectivity, it can also give you a bulk characteristic for comparing against the in situ data. So yes, it is absolutely critical that you have this um, context to interpret your measurements. So almost no experiment that I do right now makes measurements of in situ without the remote sensing because you, you just really can't understand or interpret the data as well. And that can be, you can either use one plane to do that where you have remote sensors. Of course, then you have a dead zone plus or minus 100 meters about the aircraft, which can actually be important if you're measuring something <laughs> like the melting layer or the dendritic growth layer. Um, then if you have two aircraft, that's nice because you have the complete picture. But, you know, your two aircraft inevitably fly at different speeds and it's hard to keep them together. So, uh, but in general, it's very important to have that uh, in situ remote sensing uh, interpretation. Mahin, there are a couple of more questions. After that, we'll come to the Yeah, um, Sachin Deshpande is asking, uh, you have shown the cloud DSD. How does it impact the precipitation efficiency? Well, I would say the cloud DSD is an important piece of information <clears throat> to understand the precipitation efficiency uh, because, you know, it will, uh, it will impact the fallout of particles. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact on the precipitation efficiency. But in reality, in order to well understand precipitation efficiency, you're going to need far more than just the in situ measurements. You're going to need some sort of measurements at the ground to understand the hydrology, the rain. You're going to need the radar measurements to understand the evolution in the vertical column. And probably you really need, one thing I haven't talked too much about is the need for modeling studies. I think you really need the modeling studies as well to understand precipitation efficiency, where the models need to be well evaluated against the observations that you obtain to make sure that the models are representing reality. The models represent reality, then you can do all kinds of extra sensitivity studies to try and better understand what affects precipitation efficiency. Yeah, uh, there are no, no more questions from the audiences. Yeah. Okay, the only remarks are there. Yeah. Okay, um, from our uh, panel, are there questions? Um, Mohan, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Uh, yeah, Greg, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I want to know, uh, have, you, have you looked into the, this uh, cloud updraft measurements and uh, how important are those in determining the cloud microphysical properties? Excellent question, and yes, we have. Um, you know, one way, well, one way we did that is I showed one example in the presentation looking at the generating cells, where basically, typically in the generating cells, you are in updrafts, and we showed that that was very important. We have done other studies from other projects that I did not have time to talk about today, where you can use like bat probes or turbulent probes, which can give you decent estimates of the updrafts. Uh, you know, that is a bit of a hard measurement to do, but you can at least get a good knowledge of whether you're in an updraft, a downdraft, an intense updraft, things like that. And you can at least get your updrafts within about a meter per second, probably even better than that, as long as you're flying flat level. If you're doing ramp descents and descents or spirals, then your onboard measurements of updrafts, downdrafts are going to be more difficult. That has a huge impact on the microphysics. Uh, we have a paper that we recently published in 2020 in the quarterly journal of the Royal Meteorological Society, Gina Masio, my former student, was the first author on that, where we looked at how the size distributions varied, whether we were in updrafts or downdrafts. We saw a big impact. Um, also, um, we have observations, McFarquhar and Black, a few other projects. We also looked at them from wintertime storms. And I have one of my students right now who's doing a comparable analysis with a set of data that we collected off the northeast coast of the United States a couple of years ago, looking at the updrafts and downdrafts. So yes, we try to measure the updrafts and downdrafts whenever possible. That is a very important measurement. It has a huge impact on the particle size distributions that are measured. So, you know, in addition to understanding how the size distributions or the A and B coefficients or the fall velocity diameter coefficients vary with temperature, we would 
we also need to understand how they vary in updrafts and downdrafts. Yeah, are there more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, great, very uh, nice talk, excellent talk. I indeed enjoy the talk. Uh, I have uh, just a few questions, uh, not a question actually, I want your suggestions or opinion. So regarding the modeling, global modeling, so you are talking about the ice uh, in situ measurement. So most of the climate model have uh, issue uh, of uh, simulating the uh, ice water content or ice mixing ratio. So now what you, you suggest that uh, how we can compare them or validate the climate model, say semi 5 or semi 6 uh, with the in situ or uh, any satellite measurement? What is your suggestion? Because there is very few years data or few past data. So how we can compare the model? Well, the first suggestion I would probably have is to do it on a regional basis rather than trying to do it on a global basis so that you get a good understanding of how it is uh, performing in different regions. So, you know, um, Andrew Gettleman uh, recently published a paper in the Journal of Geophysical Research where he tried to evaluate some of his climate model simulations against some of the measurements we have done in southern ocean clouds. I think the key thing is that this needs to be done statistically because, you know, we cannot be simulating individual events that are in a climate model simulation. So, you know, I would take, say, all of the observations that we collected over a field campaign in a specific region and try and look at maybe how distributions of ice mass content or we're fortunate enough to have number concentration as well, get an idea of how that compares um, to give a crude idea of how well you might be representing the cloud properties. That can be very difficult to do because you have to be aware of biases in your observations. So for example, in the Southern Ocean clouds we sample uh, we always flew above the clouds on our way toward the south to try and get an idea of what was beneath us. And if we saw clouds where there was a large amount of supercooled water, and especially, especially associated with the frontal system, and if we believed all of that supercooled water, there was large amounts of water that descended so that it was below a thousand feet above the ocean surface, we would not go and penetrate those clouds because if we started penetrating them, you know, it's low. We can only go to a thousand feet. If we don't break yeah. out of clouds at a thousand feet, we can't go any lower. And we were worried that if we did that, we could be icing up and then we would have no way to get our plane out of there. So that was far <coughs> too dangerous. So, you know, you can use your in situ observations. But I actually have some students who are working on this, and they're showing that, well, it seems the models have more supercooled water or supercooled drizzle than our observations. But you must be aware of the biases in your observations. Uh, so remote sensing observations that are evaluated against in situ observations or satellite observations that are properly evaluated in situ observations may be the most effective way for evaluating against your climate simulations because our in situ observations, they're always over limited areas and limited times. They give us a lot of process oriented understanding, but they don't give us good large scale statistics because we only yes. have 100 hours of data. So the key, the key message here is in situ observations are a good piece of the puzzle but they're certainly not the only piece of the puzzle. You have to use them in combination with your ground-based remote sensing observations and your satellite-based observations as well. Yeah. Uh, Thank sometimes, you. Uh, sometimes in situ observations, like uh, depending on the objectives, like uh, it will be biased to the uh, the times when the clouds are in the growing stage, not in the precipitating stage. So, so the 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 whole microphysics itself is uh, kind of uh, biased towards the, uh, yeah. the green state. So, yeah. so that can give a kind of a different, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. a different type of bias. That's yeah, right. yeah. 
and uh, the mass diameter relationship that what you have explained very nice actually we have also observed that uh, it impact on the precipitation like in the uh, strongly electric field cloud and weakly electric field cloud we have seen that a b are different and most of the model has bias uh, underestimate in strongly electric field cloud precipitation so if you change uh, the uh, in modeling experiment changing a b coefficient so you can get the better so this, you have explained very nicely this is very important the mass uh, and diameter relationship thank you very much yeah and yes the electric field can be very important you can get yeah. these chain light aggregates that will affect your ab yeah and then you know thara makes a good point about the sampling you also have to try to be disciplined in your projects you know to to do routine sampling don't go to the most exciting cloud if you want really representative uh statistics and uas's if we can start to get networks of uas's flying maybe we can start to get some of those growing just developing clouds yeah uh, Greg, i have i have i have one question yeah uh, there is any study that uh, that compares the result of uh, different algorithms say you, you have a fixed uh, drop size distribution of ice particles and you have say a b c d algorithms i mean developed by different groups so we, we do we have any kind of comparison yes if you look at um there is paper published in um the AMS monographs in 2017 I am the lead author and what we did in that case is we took one set of data that was uh collected and we had a number of different groups run this uh through their algorithms so we could see what type of differences we got in the size distributions uh so just to understand the processing statistics and then based on that um i don't think we've ever published this the group um in clermont ferrand the group in environment and climate change canada and us we took the same observations from the high ice water content field campaign and we said okay we may not all agree on what is the best way to process the data and in fact we don't but we said we are all going to process our data in the exact same way. This is what our depth of field is. This is how it varies with size. This is how we're going to do the shattering corrections. This is how we're going to define the size of the particles. When we do that, we can actually begin to better understand our processing algorithms and you know, we were not able to do the workshop that we planned to do in Pune this summer, which was unfortunate, but we were hoping to have follow-up discussions on that. So you know yeah. again hopefully when the pandemic ends then we can come together again and um start to discuss those yeah. ideas again and see where we've got in the next in the last 2 to 3 years because yeah. people have been busy imp improving their algorithms we need to get back and communicate again how we all improved our algorithms and yeah. what we did and then in terms of comparing different probes yeah that's that's being done routinely and there's a paper right now in re under review by Emma Yarvanen for the Journal of Geophysical Research where she compares the FIPS halo observations against the 2D stereo observations that we made during that project and showing how they agree and how they differ. Yeah thank, thank you. you. Yeah I think uh, we had a lot of uh, discussion and yes <laughs> Greg also uh, actually he has some other appointment to let, later on anybody else want to have any question Padma you want to ask something yeah hello Greg it's really hello. wonderful wonderful talk and a very good uh, discussion actually so uh, i just wanted to know like uh, this cloud probes uh, like uh, how often we need to calibrate and uh, and how can we correct the data for uh, drifting calibration is it possible or can we do it you would certainly i would think you would want a calibration done by the manufacturer or a very qualified person 
before or after every single field project. I think that would be very important to do. Obviously, you can't do it between flights. You can't switch your probe back to the manufacturer. Uh, it's also very important to, you know, check if there's any drift in the performance of the probe over the course of the experiment. You know, you'd want to regularly run your glass beads through it, make sure that, you know, things aren't uh, shifting during the course of the experiment. And also doing these consistency checks, you know, after a field campaign, see if, say, if you want to compare your CDP versus your hot wire probe, was there any drift in how that comparison evolved over the course of the field campaign? That can provide you a lot of information. Other important things to do, what we always do, for your optical array probes, the hope would be, over the course of a flight, all of your diodes should be shadowed approximately the same number of times. Sometimes it works out that, you know, a couple diodes become bad, or, you know, if you look and see that one diode is being shadowed, four times more often than the other diode, then that suggests that you've got a problem. And then, you know, then you can go and try and come up with a way for correcting that problem, maybe by ignoring those couple of diodes. So quality control of the data, doing these tests, looking at the, you know, the uh, end diode voltages, the middle diode voltage, keep your eye on that through the whole project. Do your glass bead comparisons, your spinning desk, you know, do all of that regularly. And then after the project, just look at your analysis and see if you've had any drift over the course of the experiment and how your probes were changing. So you're at least aware of the problems, then come up with a way of correcting the problems. Or sometimes you just have to throw out the data from a probe for one or two flights if it wasn't performing well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And... Uh, this is really uh, fantastic uh, discussion that we had on various topics. We, we would like to have some more, but uh, I think now we should stop. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, maybe it's uh, another time we can have more discussions and uh, appreciate your uh, kindness in giving this talk. And uh, on behalf of everyone at IATM and all those who are interested in this talk, so let me thank you. and. Uh, let us uh, and now finish. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to follow up with anybody by email too if they were, did not have the opportunity to ask their question. Definitely, they will. Uh, they have your email address also, so they can okay. contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation, all Farah and Mahan, Sashin. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.